We're studying Martin Heidegger's contributions to philosophy of the event, a text written about 10 years after Being in Time was published, and marking in the eyes of many scholars a transition to a new kind of thinking in Heidegger. Our goal together will not be to review the scholarship on this text or its place in Heidegger's corpus, however. Instead, we will follow Heidegger's thinking as we encounter it in the writing, taking our cue from what he himself indicates and trying to put ourselves before the questions that he faced as he faced them as much as possible. We want to encounter Heidegger's questions. We want to be there by his side as he works them through. Later, you can always consult the secondary sources and measure them against the only possible standard, the highest level of your own direct comprehension of Heidegger himself. One consideration we need to discuss before we jump into the text is the translation we're using. It's not the only translation there is, and at some point you could well take an interest in the difference between the two translations and in the more general problem of translating Heidegger. For our purposes, however, this translation is more than satisfactory in gaining our first foothold into what we will soon be calling Heidegger's inceptual thinking. Naturally, there will be specific words to which we pay particular attention, but I suggest that we don't focus too much at the outset on issues of translation, except as they emerge from the writing itself. For instance, if Heidegger makes translation a theme somewhere in the book. Otherwise, you should certainly look at the brief translator's introduction, which provides some guidance for how to treat the translation. Now a few words on the structure of the book. If you first look at the table of contents, you'll see that the book is organized into eight sections. Section eight is, as we learn at least from the editors afterward on page 405, a sort of recapitulation of the previous sections or an attempt to grasp the whole once again. That means that prior to this recapitulation, we have seven sections. They are in order, the prospect, the resonating, the interplay, the leap, the grounding, the future ones, and the last god. By the end of our time together, you will have a clear sense of what these are and how they relate to one another and to the project of inceptual thinking. Our focus in this session will be on section one, prospect, and we won't get through all of that, not even close. You could spend many, many, many hours just going through that particular very rich and very beautiful text. And before we even read the first numbered paragraph of section one, starting on page six, there are a few preliminary things in the book itself that we should stop to notice. Let's turn now to the first of them. You'll see if you have a look that right after the title page and before the start of the section called prospect, there's a sort of epigraph. Here's what it says. What was held back in long hesitation is herewith made fast in an indicative way as the straight edge of a configuration. That tells us something about the nature of this work. Heidegger is not giving us a spontaneous stream of consciousness or some set of remarks made without deliberation. He's also not giving us any kind of treaties or thoughts that ripened in the bright light of day. Rather, these Thoughts, as he says, were something held back in long hesitation, something he pondered over and thought about deeply for a long time. You'll see as we go through this text that to hold back or to keep concealed or in reserve is for Heidegger something belonging to being itself, to a forgotten dimension of being, a dimension the recovery of which is in a way at the heart of Heidegger's project. Being holds itself back and keeps itself concealed. But what is only ever held back and concealed does not come to light. So if all we had was a concealment, if all we had was a holding back, then there would never be something that comes to light. Whereas Heidegger is here making fast or showing us what he has held back in an indicative way. So the first thing we saw, something was held back in long hesitation. Now we need to try to know, what does it mean that he's going to present it in an indicative way? What does that mean? It means that we shouldn't expect more from Heidegger than indications. We certainly should not expect deductive proofs or the kind 
of demonstrations that guarantee certainty in the sciences or in mathematics. That's no criticism against Heidegger either. The fact that he's only going to give us indications and not proofs. As we will learn a little later on page 13, quote, in philosophy, propositions are never subject to proof, unquote. We'll see why more clearly later. I'm only giving you some indications for now. And lastly, we have a third notion in this epigraph that what was held back is made fast in an indicative way as the straight edge of a configuration. Now, what could that mean? Well, that refers to this seven-part articulation that I mentioned earlier, which is a neat or clean-cut straight edge, a division between the stages, phases, or moments of inceptual thinking, its configuration. The prospect, resonating, interplay, that gives us a clear-cut straight edge configuration of what Heidegger is indicating of what was held back for a long time in hesitation. It might seem like we're spending too much time on these three short lines, and if we spent that much time on everything that was worth our time in this book, our course would never end. But I'd like to help you to get into the habit of reading Heidegger carefully in this way. That's how you'll get the most out of it when you continue reading him on your own. And if you've taken any other courses in the school, I think you'll know by now, and if not, let me just tell you, that this kind of slow reading that brings out all of the richness and all of the resonance of every word and passage and phrase is, I think, in general, the best way to learn from these authors. Now, it's not something that you can do right away. It requires you to have read a lot in order to begin to see the meaning and be able to unpack the meaning, but it's just something that's worth learning how to do, and it's something that I will try to model to a certain extent. Here, in fact, is another brief example of that. If you turn to the page that says prospect on it, the next page after this little epigraph, you'll see a footnote to the title of the section. The footnote refers to Heidegger's black notebooks, especially to notebooks two, four, five, and six. You'll see that notebook three is missing from the list. So he mentions two, four, five, and six, and you have in English two, four, five, and six, as well as three. So the question is, where is notebook three in Heidegger's footnote? Why is it missing? In the black notebooks, notebook three deals primarily with the period when Heidegger was rector of the University of Freiburg, with the period of what we might call his political activity, his attempt to turn the institutions and organizations of national socialism toward a philosophical direction. I wanted to mention this to you because it shows us two things. First, that the bulk of the black notebooks, contrary to popular belief, does not deal primarily with political things in a narrow sense, but rather, according to Heidegger's own footnote here, with the prospect of inceptual thinking more broadly. You see, he cites the black notebooks in relationship to this section called prospect, which is about the prospect of inceptual thinking and is not about politics narrowly construed. And he omits from his citation that black notebook that does deal with his political activity narrowly construed, let's say. So that tells us something about the nature of the black notebooks, which may be new to you if you've followed any of the scandals surrounding them, but more relevant to us, since after all, this is a course not on the black notebooks, but on the contributions. We learn from this footnote that the contributions in turn is not a narrowly political book. Its topic is not the political or the concept of the political or political philosophy. Otherwise, he would have referred to notebook three, where all of that is somehow the theme. It's also not focused on the narrowly institutional or organizational dimensions of human life. Because once again, if it had been, he would have included notebook three in his citation. And yet, there may be a reconfiguration or reconstitution of the political that follows from Heidegger's thoughts. So just because he's not dealing with the political or the organizational or the institutional narrowly construed, we may have to reinterpret the political, the organizational, and the institutional as a result 
of what we learn from his inceptual thinking, from this prospect of a new kind of thinking. But lest we get too far ahead of ourselves, we should begin with the text proper now and start to get a sense of what Heidegger's project is. So with these preliminaries out of the way, let's look at the first long section of the book, which still precedes the first numbered paragraph. 